Hey everyone, welcome to part 3 of my VFD project. In this video, I'll go over how I programmed my variable frequency drive. I used the Arduino environment with an Atmega328 microcontroller on a custom PCB. We'll go over some interesting parts of what it took to get to the final result, like understanding how to work with interrupt service routines, configuring PWM signals, and implementing debounce filters. Alright, let's get started. The code for this VFD is based on a typical Arduino code template. A setup function, which runs once at startup, a main loop function, which runs continuously, and an interrupt service routine, which runs every time it's triggered. The initialization of registers and setting up the serial communication happens in the setup function. The non-time critical tasks are handled in the main loop, things like handling digital and analog signals, updating LED displays, etc. And finally, the time critical PWM outputs are handled in an interrupt service routine. An interrupt service routine, or interrupt, interrupts the main loop whenever it's triggered. There are a number of possible triggers. Some triggers are hardware interrupts. For example, some digital input was toggled. And other triggers can be due to some internal process of the microcontroller. For example, an interrupt can be triggered when an analog to digital conversion has finished. I'm going to focus on the timer overflow trigger, since that's what I used in this project. That Mega328 has three general purpose timers, which can be used to output PWM signals. There are a few modes of operation for the timer. I chose the symmetrical mode, where the counter increments till its maximum value, then decrements down to zero. This method allows for a higher resolution for the PWM outputs. We can see that every time a timer finishes a cycle, a timer overflow event happens, which, if configured, prompts an interrupt to happen. The time it takes for a full cycle depends on the chosen timer mode of operation. We can see that for the symmetrical mode of operation that I chose, a full cycle takes twice as long as a non-symmetrical mode of operation. So the time between interrupts is twice as long. Here's an example of how a piece of code runs with an interrupt. The code in the main loop is being run continuously. The timer is here on the right. And every time there's a timer overflow, the microcontroller bookmarks where it stopped in the main loop, jumps over to execute the interrupt, and goes back to the main loop to continue running from where it left off. But wait, why do we need to output PWM signals to operate an induction motor? In the overview video, I mentioned that there are optimal current waveforms to run an electrical motor, and the way a three-phase motor is built means that the current waveforms need to be 120 degrees apart from one another. So we understand we need to generate three current waveforms, and let's assume the desired waveform is a sine wave, even though that's not necessarily the case. Assuming we have a voltage source to operate our motor, why are we using PWM signals and not some other method? Let's first see what's the required voltage waveform to generate a sinusoidal current waveform. Let's take just one motor phase, which can be modeled by an inductor and a resistor in series. Let's look at the relation between voltage and current. V equals Ri plus L times Di to Dt. I'm ignoring the back EMF since it's not important for the explanation right now. If we take the Laplace transform of this differential equation, we get the following relation between current and voltage. I to V equals 1 over Ls plus R. I wrote a short Python script to plot the relation between the current and the voltage. Omega is the sine wave frequency of the waveforms. I'm creating a time sample array. Let's assume the phase has a resistance of 1 ohm and an inductance of 10 millihenry. Next, I'm defining the voltage waveform, both as a continuous signal and as a PWM signal. Next, I'm defining the voltage to current transfer function. Like we saw earlier, the equation is 1 over Ls plus R. Now I'm running LSIM, which allows us to plot the transfer function response to an arbitrary input which is the voltage waveform in this case. And then I plot the data. Let's run it with the continuous waveform first. Okay, great. As expected, since this is a linear time invariant system, to generate a sinusoidal current waveform, we need to input a sinusoidal voltage waveform. But how do we create a sinusoidal voltage waveform? We usually have a constant voltage source, let's say a 12 volt battery. How can I change the voltage on the phases when I have a constant voltage source? Take a second to pause the video and think of possible solutions. A possible solution to this is a linear voltage regulator like the LM317. 
we can use it to easily regulate the output voltage. The only problem is that it's very inefficient when outputting voltages which are a lot lower than the input voltage. Since the power dissipated on a linear voltage regulator is the delta between the input and output voltages multiplied by the drawn current. A more efficient method to output a changing voltage is using switching power supplies, which are implemented using PWM signals. You can see that when the input and output voltages are very close, the LDO is more efficient than a switching power supply across a large range of load. However, once the voltage differs enough, the switching power supply is significantly more efficient. The downside of the switching method is that the voltage changes rapidly and isn't a continuous waveform. Let's go back to the Python script and see how the current waveform is affected by abruptly changing voltages. I'm changing the input voltage waveform to be a PWM signal. And now when I run it, we can see the PWM signal and the resulting current waveform. Let's zoom in a bit. There are significant current ripples now. However, the current waveform is still maintaining a quasi-sinusoidal waveform. An inductor resists changes in current, so the larger it is, the more it'll filter the current waveform. Additionally, we see that the current ripple happens at the PWM switching frequency. So the faster the PWM frequency, the smaller the current ripple will be. Nowadays, since the PWM switching frequency is very fast and efficiency is a top concern, most applications use PWM signals to generate these current waveforms. Okay, let's get back to understanding how to use that mega timers to output PWM signals. Each timer can command two comparators, comparator A and comparator B, each of them controlling their respective PWM output. For the interrupt source, I use timer 0, which is an 8-bit counter, so its max value is 254. To choose when the counter commands the comparators, we set the comparator values. In this manner, we can create square waves with different duty cycles. Since comparators A and B look at the same counter, if we set them to the same value but invert their logic, meaning when comparator A outputs a high signal, comparator B will output a low signal, would be in the ideal position to command a pair of transistors inside an inverter. Let's see an example. Let's assume the max value of the counter is 6 instead of 254, and let's say we set the comparator values to 3. The comparator outputs are toggled every time the comparator value, 3 in this case, is reached. So they're toggled twice every counter cycle, once going up and once going down. Okay, we talked about two comparators. Each pair of comparators can command one motor phase, but we need to command three phases to control a three phase motor. Luckily, we have two more timers with their own pair of comparators. So we can synchronize all three timers, and every time timer zero overflows, we get a chance to update the reference values of comparators A and B for all three timers. And that's how we can generate three sine waves, phase shifted by 120 degrees, to drive our induction motor. Let's see how this was implemented in the code. First, let's look at the timer configuration. I stop all the timers to synchronize them. I configure the timer waveform mode to be symmetrical. I decide what the comparator outputs will be in the incrementing and decrementing cases. I set the comparator initial values. I do this for all the timers. Additionally, I enable the timer zero overflow interrupt. And finally, I initialize the counter values and restart the counters, so they're all synchronized. In the interrupt, I'm using a sine wave lookup table, which is 15 indices long. This was a compromise, since the more indices I have, the more accurate the sine wave will be. However, that would also increase the number of indices I would need to increment to go through 360 degrees, so it would limit my top speed and speed resolution. For more details, you can read the explanations at the top. The values in the lookup table correspond to the timer resolution, meaning that the max value in the lookup table depends on the timer max value, which is 254. And I increment the lookup table index depending on the desired frequency. The faster the frequency, the faster I increment it. You can see the dead time values. This is done to prevent shoot through, meaning both upper and bottom transistors are accidentally enabled simultaneously, causing a short circuit. So if I decide to enable the upper transistor, I first disable the bottom transistor, wait a few timer clocks, and only then do I enable the upper transistor. Additionally, the comparator outputs are filtered because of the isolators. So below a certain duty cycle, the signal barely has enough time to reach a high state. So I added an if statement 
which simply zeroes out any commands below this threshold. Next up, let's talk about debounce filters, why they're needed, and how to implement one. Input signals may be noisy in their transition, causing undesired triggering. There are several ways to overcome this issue in hardware and software. One of those ways is with debounce filters. Debounce filters wait for the digital input to remain constant for a specified amount of time before considering it truly high or low. Imagine pressing a mechanical button. Mechanical switching isn't ideal. Once the button is pressed, the electrical signal may bounce around before the mechanical switch reaches full contact, causing undesired results. Some microcontrollers even come with this option already implemented. Here's an example of a TI microcontroller. They call this feature input qualification, but it's essentially the same thing. The user specified the desired frequency to measure the signal and how many samples should be counted to be considered a valid signal. Since that Mega doesn't have this feature built in, I implemented it in the main loop. Let's take a look at the implementation. The goal of the button is simply to allow a change of configuration between three phase motors and one phase motors. Here's the button function, which continuously reads the digital input connected to the button. I'm using a macro. Let's see what it does. I'm looking at the pin C register, which contains the data of the port C digital inputs, right shifting it by pin C4, which is the digital input the button is connected to. That way, the first bit is now the data bit of input pin number four. Next, I'm ending the result with one. So if pin number four is one, the result will be one. And if it's zero, the result will be zero. Next, this digital pin is connected to ground. So once I press it, the signal goes low. So I'm nodding the result to get a logic one when the button was pressed. This is kind of a cumbersome process. However, I'm doing it this way instead of using the function digital read since it's faster to read directly from the registers rather than run the digital read function. Okay, that process was only to check the state of the digital pin. Next, we need to make sure the button was pressed continuously for a specified amount of time. To do this, I use two timers. The first is incremented every main loop, and the second is incremented in the main loop only if the button was pressed. So if the button is pressed every consecutive loop, I would expect the difference between the timers not to be greater than one. If it is, it means that there was a main loop in which the button wasn't pressed. So I zero the second timer and start over. This is done until the second timer reaches a predefined value, and only then do I consider the button pressed. Okay, that covers the bounce filters. I won't go over the code line by line since that can be quite tedious. So I'll leave a link in the description to the GitHub repository if you wanna go over it. There are a lot of comments to make it easier to understand. And finally, I'll leave a link in the description to an interesting article that discusses why we need to put a capacitor between the reset and ground pins when uploading a new sketch to the Atmega. All right, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching and see you next time.